Hey, welcome back to the Tree Church Bible Study. It's a podcast where we sit down, we read the scripture line by line, section by section, break it down, talk about how it applies to our life. And today I'm joined by a Mr. Brandon Leitniker. How are you doing today? I'm joined just fine. Are you feel are you excited? I am super excited. Awesome. We're also joined by Stacy Crawford. How are you? I'm good today. How are awesome. you? Awesome. Doing well. Brandon, you are the executive director of Cool Stuff here. Is that right? <laughs> Pretty much, it yeah. feels like that. Yeah, 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 the director. I actually think it's opposite. I get to be the director of, I think, the fun things, all the creative things. I think you have the boring stuff. No, I have the stuff that matters most, you know? <laughs> stuff I'm, I'm that actually <laughs> actually makes people's lives better <laughs> yeah. and more. Yeah, I just, I, yeah, we just sing cool songs in, over in my department. No, so, Brandon, you're the, uh, you're the di- director of discipleship, is that right? Correct, yes. Awesome. What is that in, like, a, what's your elevator pitch for what that is? What's that job in a nutshell? Yeah, I really get to be so integrated in people's par- people's lives, talking through how their faith applies and how they grow in that faith. And, and so I get to be a part of the story from when they're children all the way up to our oldest adult and get to help them process through that. And my team and I, I guess I should say, yeah, absolutely. and all of that. So uh, it's an incredible privilege and honor, and I couldn't ask for a, a better position to be a part of. That's yeah, incredible. Yeah, you, you get to really oversee that discipleship process from the time that I have kids as toddlers yeah. to, to hopefully by the time, you know, they're having kids of their own, which yep. is that's mm-hmm. super cool. And Stace, how would you define your job? In uh, that show? So I am the director of hospitality. All right, so. you're on the cool team. You're on the, you're, you're on the cool team with me. <laughs> I'm pretty much get to be that connecting point between all departments. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, but yeah, just getting the opportunity to welcome people to the church, making sure that everyone has such a welcoming experience. They feel loved. They feel God's presence as they walk into the building, mm. and then helping them make that connection into connect groups mm-hmm. into. Uh, joining teams and all of those yeah. types of things. So yeah, super cool. Yeah. Awesome. Well, hey, today we're going to jump into Second Corinthians chapter one through chapter two, verse four. Yep. Before we do, we're going to start with a couple of questions. The first one being, what is your favorite cereal? What do you, you guys know, got? We were just discussing this, <laughs> and I feel like there's been several references this week where just like my '90s kid comes out, like mm. the movie. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles just came out recently. Incredible. And is it I'm already like, out? Yeah. Oh, and I'm like back it. in the zone of it. Yeah. Like I'm like trying to collect all the toys and do all those things. So the same thing works for me with cereal. It's like this thing where I look at it and I'm just, I just love every aspect of cereal and, and can still eat it at every meal. Every I view it as day. like a dessert at this stage of my life. I can yeah. eat it. I'll eat it after <laughs> yeah, dinner. Like a treat. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but I would say my favorite cereal of all time is like Apple Jacks. Like, mm. Ooh, I just, wasn't expecting that's that. One. That's yeah. a great answer. Yeah, yeah. just like the we, me and Alex, childish. me and Alex were just talking about uh, uh, Apple Jacks. I've I've woke up. Now I'm not kidding. This is gonna sound like I'm j- doing a joke for the podcast, but it's 100 percent real. I've woke up almost every day for the last month with the theme song of Apple Jacks stuck in my head from the, like the '90s. Com- <laughs> was this '90s commercial where it was a cinnamon stick that was like a Rastafarian guy, and it goes like, "Here I come, I am Sydney Mon." Every morning that I wake up, that's, that's my funny. first thought. I don't know why. <laughs> At first, I thought I was prophetic. I'm like, "God's got to be telling me something." <laughs> I don't I think that's the Apple case. <laughs> Maybe if I have a bowl, it'll finally stop. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. Stacey, just take it away. <laughs> <laughs> what do you got, Stacy? Um, I mine's a toss up between two. I really like cinnamon life hmm. or Ooh, frosted mini wheats. Life is great. Which probably doesn't surprise anybody. <laughs> 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 You just became a 90-year-old. <laughs> the only thing worse would have been like just not the frosted, just mini wheat. No, they have to be frosted. Yeah, I, grape I nuts. Do their you know? regular sure. mini what about for you, Michael? You know what I really do like? I feel like I do like boring cereal. So my favorites are probably just regular life, mm-hmm. um, regular Cheerios. Honey nuts fine, but I, I'll, I'll go oh, regular. Uh, Chex. <laughs> like really boring. I just like I it. I don't know why. Anything yeah. anything kind of brand flavored that's like I'm sure at my alley, you know? I, Yeah, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, question number two. This one's a little bit topical um, because I don't know that it, it doesn't matter, but it's been the news lately that the that there might be some aliens that the government's talking about. Do you guys? You can go as deep or as shallow as you want. You can say yes or no. Do you believe in aliens? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> like part of me feels like yeah, there could potentially be some other sure. life form out there. I mean, you know, but then part of me is like I don't want to believe that there are yeah. these other beings that could potentially take us over. Yeah, I only point. want to believe in them if they're nice. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. If they're nice, that's okay. If yeah. they're going to be my friend, yeah. then yeah. great. I like more friends, why not? What about you, Brandon? Yeah, just too long ago, not too long ago, I should say, I finished C.S. Lewis's Space Trilogy. And, so good. And it's, I know it's made up, but man, Underrated. does it open up my mind to like mm-hmm. believe that there is something potentially out there yeah. and mm-hmm. that God is that 
has that ability to do that. Not only that, yeah. but also that the expanse is just so great. You right. know what I mean? No like there's gotta be something out there in my estimation. But <laughs> yeah. I you know, know I, think, that is. <laughs> I, I think there's like, you know, I like believing in, in weird things. You know, there's that, like the, po <laughs> the poster from X-Files, like I want to believe that's like, <laughs> like I want to believe that stuff. And so I think, I think I do. I think it is an interesting thing as a Christian though. Like if mm -hmm. there's aliens, mm -hmm. like did like, did God have another only son that had to go die for their sins? Sure. Are they sinless? Do they have sin? Mm -hmm. Like, what's the, you some know, deep questions. some deep questions that come along with aliens. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I hope they are because I think it'd be neat. <laughs> like, I think it's like a, a fun thought that they're aliens, but I don't, I don't know. I don't know for sure, but mm -hmm. I think it'd be cool. Yeah. All right. You guys ready to get into it? Yes. yes let's do this. Awesome. So this is second Corinthians chapter one, uh, verse one. This letter is from Paul chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ to Jesus. And from our brother, Timothy. I'm writing to God's church in Corinth and to all his holy people throughout Greece. May God, our Father, and Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. God offers comfort to all. All praise to God, the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. God is our merciful Father and source of all comfort. He comforts us in all of our troubles so that we can confront, uh, comfort, each, comfort each other. Um, when they are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. For the more we suffer for Christ, the more God will shower us with his comfort through Christ. Even when we are weighed down with troubles, it is for your comfort and salvation. For when we ourselves are comforted, uh, we will certainly comfort you. And there can, uh, then, you can be patiently, then you can patiently endure the same things we suffer. We are confident that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in the comfort God gives us. So when I read that, you know, first of all, it's like a reminder of how generous God is, that even that even in suffering, we know that anybody who's been a human for any amount of time with a, with a conscious brain knows that suffering is a part of life. It could be as simple as stubbing your toe, stepping on a Lego, or it could be as like as traumatic as some of the big awful events that we know can come with just being a person, what it's mm -hmm. like to live in the human experience. But to me, even reading this opening part is Paul, what I love so much about his heart is he isn't shying away from that. It's not this prosperity gospel of like, man, if you just do the, you know, do the right stuff, then nothing mm -hmm. bad will happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's this clear example of suffering is inevitable. Suffering will happen, but there is comfort in that. And is that as they experience that comfort, they can then teach it to others and you can kind of co-labor in it. You know, the, what I jotted down here is that there's unity in suffering. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't know about you guys, but, but there are moments where all of a sudden I'll feel alone in my suffering or I'll feel, mm -hmm. um, I'll feel hurt or I'll feel, um, like, like no one can identify with me and all it takes is one person saying, I've been there. I know what it's mm -hmm. like, here's how I got through it. That all of a sudden I feel, you know, incredible amount of peace. Yeah. How have you seen this in practice at our church and even specifically in your ministry when you get an opportunity to look at, you know, how suffering applies to the body of Christ as a whole? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for me, even Michael, I think weekly we have conversations. Let's talk about it from the ministry standpoint, like yeah. somebody who's leading ministry. We have conversations weekly where I'm like, I can feel so isolated in the experiences that I'm having as a leader. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so I'll just sit yeah. in those for a moment and it's like, man, I'm the only one dealing with this. It seems like everybody else is having so much success and just feeling great, riding high. Mm. Yeah. And then we'll sit across the table from one another and I'll be like, man, I'm in struggle town I'm with hurting. this particular thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you're like, what? Like I'm dealing with the same exact thing. Yeah. And so even in ministry, that transparency leads to like an agreeance on like, man, we're both going through this. And mm -hmm. I think it's interesting that word that he uses isn't just like I sympathize with you. It's I'm, I'm in this with you. Right. I'm, we're both strengthening one another by recognizing it might not change our situation, but wow. we're both agreeing together that we're in this and we're going to continue to move on. And mm -hmm. Christ gave us that example, you know, first and foremost, and Paul identifies that. Um, but then also just to have that example in ministry, you know, yeah. as we're both leading to have that same experience is great. Yeah, and you get so that good. also if you're sitting, I'm sure you have a ton of references, Stacey, of like right. sitting across the room from somebody and you're mm -hmm. like, oh. Yeah, yeah, I've done through that too. Right, yeah, right. Yeah, what about you, Susan? Yeah, I was, I was going to say the same thing, essentially, is just that those so many times, like I, I can specifically think just this past year has just been wild for me. <laughs> um, it just taking on more responsibilities, doing a lot of other things, taking steps of obedience, and so many times, just like you guys, like feeling so alone in it, feeling overwhelmed and feeling you know, like, oh man, how, how in the world am I possibly going to be able to do this? Yeah. And you do start to feel isolated. But then just, I, I mean, Michael, I had numerous conversations with him, numerous conversations with Brandon and other people where it's like, you're not the only one who has felt this. And mm -hmm. I think that it is encouraging to know, or even like when I do see people who are struggling and hurting in the congregation, like 
I want to help them. I, I, yeah. I am a person that I can almost like feel other people's pain. So I cry with them. I, mm. I want to comfort them because I'm like, we're all in this together. We all suffer, mm. but we also all have Christ, you know, so we can yeah. help each other. We can lift each other up. And I think it becomes dangerous when you think that you are suffering alone. Mm -hmm. Instead, it's like, no, I need to go talk to people because they probably feel the exact same way that I do. Um, yeah, big time. That's so good. I, I think like, like one of the common things that is a talking point in my marriage is the need for validation. So I don't know about you guys, but mm. like, I know that like if me and Gina are in an argument and it feels like, it feels like we're in a rock and a hard place, an easy way to navigate the next step is to validate somebody's experience. So mm -hmm. she comes to me and she's like, man, I'm really frustrated because you did this. I can have, and for, and for that reason, I'm suffering. I'm hurt. Like my heart hurts, you know? Yeah. And it would, it's way easy for me to be like, to, to disqualify it and be like, mm. Oh, well, you only think that because of blah, 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 blah. Yeah. <laughs> like go right into argument yeah. mode right. yeah. where there's so much power in just saying like that would be really frustrating. I've been mm -hmm. in a situation where it just it hurts it yeah. just to have someone validate your suffering. Mm -hmm. Right. I think that's one of the best things that, you know, we really read Paul here saying is like and we're going to read it even more in a second about how, how complicated his time was in, in Asia mm -hmm. to hear that you're not alone in that, to hear somebody validate your experience mm -hmm. as a human and say like, man, to be human is to suffer. I know, like I I feel you. I'm with you. You are not alone. It just it, it it's a reminder that that we serve a God that's so generous not only in giving us access to Him but each other which builds us up. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, yeah. yeah. And I can't imagine, like, imagine if Paul went the other way with this and he's just like, yeah, things are great here. <laughs> like, yeah. if you're suffering, like, man, you must be doing something wrong. Yeah, right. How yeah, isolating all. and lonely right. that yeah, would feel. But this exactly. idea that even Paul, who's this incredible church leader, is like, yeah, suffering is a very real thing. Right? Yeah. yeah. And a quick plug for groups. I mean, that's exactly hmm. why we encourage everybody yes. in our church to get in groups is yeah. because you are by yourself in your faith and you're not designed to do it that way. Right. So when you sit across for sure. in a circle or you sit in a room from somebody who says, I've been there, done that, mm -hmm. or I just even as you were saying, like, I can acknowledge that you're going through something and, and be a comfort to you and care for you in that way it changes your life dramatically mm -hmm. and so that's why we're always like man you have to get in a group of people who mm -hmm. are going to encourage you in that way 100%. yeah we could talk about that all day like the <laughs> yeah. idea of like of if you don't have like like um i remember even i've seen the transition just in my lifetime and i'm only 30 so we're talking about a, like a short amount of time compared to like generational change but I remember as a kid it being normal to go to my neighbor's house and asking for something. Like mm -hmm. my mom would be like, hey, can you ask for an egg from the neighbor's house, you know? I wouldn't do that now. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, right. I'm not going to send my kid over. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, where, you know, I heard a comedian do a joke about it where he's like, when I was a kid, people would just it's like stop by his house. Like his mom would always have food aside. I'd like, go, oh, it's for company. It's mm -hmm. like, what the heck? What, what company? Like just in case. <laughs> it before cell, cell phones. People would just stop by. Like I was in the neighborhood, so I stopped in, right? He's like, now, he said, if somebody pulls into my driveway, it's like, everybody get down. <laughs> <laughs> for sure yeah, but we are true. living in a more lonely time than ever yeah. in that sense where people do yeah. have this incredible deficit of community and and yet yeah, to, to the point of groups like like that's where church comes in like when you're at a church where you can find church organically you know mm -hmm. where you can find community there we have a church that offers you something like connect groups which gives you like built-in community that's right. god driven that's going to bring you close man it is so right. powerful now, i'm at a point now where i can't imagine life without that mm -hmm. you know it, it would sound so incredibly lonely right? and i, I think yeah. something that I think we have to be aware is that Satan wants us to think that we're alone in our suffering. Mm -hmm. You well, know, like yeah. he's going to lie to us and be like, you're the only one, you know, just yep. like we were kind of saying. And that's why it is important to have connect group. It's important to have those people that you're like, I know I can come to you and I can say, I'm struggling with this. Yeah. I know it's not truth. It's not God's truth that he's speaking into my life, but I need somebody else to help me well walk said. through it. Yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. And, and, and the more we can lean into that, I think that that is the more that God meets us right in that place, mm -hmm. you know, and that, I think that's the the really beauty of what Paul's talking about. So let's jump into verse eight. He says, we think you ought to know, dear brothers and sisters, about mm -hmm. the trouble we went through in the province of, uh, province of Asia, where we were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure. So that's even what we're talking about, about it'd be so tough if Paul was like, things are great mm -hmm. here mm -hmm. because we're so right. holy, because we're so righteous, things are going awesome. But it's such a, you know, it sounds bad to say it, but there is a peace and comfort in knowing even godly people are going through hard things. Mm -hmm. It makes you feel just not so alone in that process. It says, we were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure, um, and we thought that we would never live through it. In fact, we expected to die, but as a result, this is, this is so cool, as a result, we stopped relying on ourselves and learned to rely only on God who raises the dead. So he's like, we literally thought that we were going to die, and we had to stop reminding ourselves that even if we do, we serve a God who raises the dead. Right. He is the one who control the situation. And he did rescue us from mortal danger, and he will rescue us again. Um, we have placed our confidence in him, and he will continue to rescue us. Um, and you are helped, and you and you are helping us by praying for us 
Um, then the many people will give thanks because God has graciously answered so many prayers for our safety. So here we see something that's like a real life example of suffering turning to something that edifies the church. Like mm -hmm. I said, on one hand, it's a comfort to know that Paul also goes through challenges and struggles. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But also him even having the wisdom to say like, and how cool is it that you guys all praying for us? Like you get to see the benefit of your prayer, the fact that I can mm -hmm. write you this letter right now. Um, and, that, and not only is there unity in suffering, that's kind of what we talked about, how unifying it is. It's also edifying, where it yeah. makes our faith feel stronger to, to experience that and to see people triumph over their brokenness, to see mm -hmm. people triumph over mm -hmm. their suffering together. Right. Have you guys ever experienced a time in your life, whether it be through ministry or otherwise, you can go into as much or as little detail as you want, mm -hmm. where your suffering was edifying to somebody, where like, mm -hmm. I went through this hard thing and it helped somebody get better or feel better. Yeah. You guys think of anything like that? Yeah, I know for me, um, I reference it a lot, but um, when we were first trying to have kids, I had an ectopic pregnancy and so I had to have surgery and that was devastating. You know, uh, you can kind of almost compare it to a miscarriage type situation. Yeah. And so, I mean, it was absolutely devastating. And then just that constant, like that season of waiting and wondering, am I ever going to have a, a child? And, and just, um, it was hard. It was a really, really hard season. And it felt like suffering because it was like, God, I have this desire. I'm not getting this desire. My body, you know, did not work the way it was supposed to. And then as we know now, uh, we have our daughter Cadence mm -hmm. and she's an incredible blessing to us. Uh, but what's really cool is that when you're in the middle of suffering, you don't realize what God, how God can then use your mm -hmm. suffering when you come out of it. And he can mm -hmm. use it while you're in it too. But yeah, super just good the season. amount of women that I have been able to minister mm -hmm. to because I literally can feel their pain. I literally can feel their experience. And, you know, when they come and they say things to me, I can say, it stinks. It, mm -hmm. It's awful. And it, yeah. it, it is such a hard moment. But then also being able to share with them what God taught me and just how I had to learn to rely on God in that season because he was literally the only one that was going to deliver yeah, me from so it. Good. Yeah, yeah, what about you, Brandon? Yeah, no, I, I always celebrate stories because I think it is a way for us to overcome. You know, I mean, that yeah. whole concept of like overcoming by the word of your testimony. And I think for me, it's always when I get an opportunity to share my story, the things that I'm struggling with, it brings people into that conversation and allows them, as we've been talking about, mm -hmm. to, to have those kind of real moments of, yeah, this is tough. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes we want to remove suffering as if, or even you spoke to it a little bit earlier, but like remove suffering as if that's like unique to us and yeah. that we're doing something completely wrong, but suffering yeah. is a part of our faith. And right. so like well to said. be able to have that conversation with somebody is so powerful. And so there's so many times where I've had, you know, sitting across the room from somebody, I keep using that reference, but sitting across the room from somebody and I'm sharing something, they're like, wow, you know, I was just dealing with that yesterday. Mm -hmm. or I was just dealing with this, you know, in my connect group, I'm dealing with this lack of peace in my life. And I was saying, well, I always live in a lack of peace, you know? So yeah. it's just like those types of moments where our stories and our testimonies are ways to do that, to edify one another, encourage one another. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so good. I, I remember the specific transition in my life where mm -hmm. I realized that suffering had value mm -hmm. where you could edify people it was yeah. where i grew up and i had really loving parents uh but my the way i grew up was also really messy and complicated mm -hmm. and like mm -hmm. you know in and out of poverty like non-stop throughout my life and sickness and um and just a, a whole bunch of challenges that come with that you know with living in poverty and li living with right. you know with, with 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 sickness and with you know sick parents and um i just remember being angry i remember talking to I think my youth pastor, if I remember right about it, and just being angry. I was like, man, I, how do, why does so-and-so, is like, you know, one of my best buds. I'm like, why, why is his life so great? Like, I basically lived in his house because it was, like, great. Like, it felt good. It felt good to be around, like, healthy people. <laughs> and he was just like, why are you, like, angry that your friend has a good life? He's mm -hmm. like, at what point do you have the spiritual maturity to recognize? Like, God, I'm grateful that, my, that not everybody goes through every bad thing that I've yeah. ever. And the same way that I'm not going through every bad thing that other people go through. Mm -hmm. He's like, that's. Um, but I was still, and that made sense. I was like, fine, okay, you know, <laughs> like, that makes sense. Like, I'm glad that, everybody, that other people have a good life, cool. <laughs> you know? But I remember the transition where I realized the value in it, not just mm -hmm. coping with it or being like, okay, that's passable. So I became a youth leader at a youth ministry that I was uh, volunteering in Florida. I just remember talking to a kid and it felt mm -hmm. like as he talked to me, he just like told me my story to mm -hmm. my face from his perspective. And mm -hmm. I was like, oh mm -hmm. my gosh. Yeah. And it yeah. wrecked me. I just gave him a big hug and I told him I loved him. And I told him a little bit about my experience and how I got through it and, and how the Lord like, you know, you know, helped, you know, my heart heal throughout that process and how, and, and, and the peace that I found amidst that suffering and amidst the, you know, the kind of the chaos that, that I grew up in at times. And, um, and I remember that was the first time I'm like, oh, this is, like, this is the point. Like mm -hmm. life is really hard and suffering is a part of it. But the fact that 
I can, you know, exactly what you guys are talking about. I can utilize that experience to, to make someone feel normal or at yeah. peace or that God cares about them in that moment. Like, what a blessing that mm -hmm. we have. Right. Um, and all of a sudden, it shifted in my mind that suffering isn't something, it's not something that I ever welcome that I'm excited about. Right. Like, yeah, I'm yeah. excited yeah. to suffer. I have delight right. in it, you know, mm -hmm. you know, not that, but I'm also not afraid of the outcome because mm -hmm. I know there is so much beauty there. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, awesome. So let's jump into verse 12. It says, uh, we can say, with confidence and a clear conscience that we have lived with God, with a God-given holiness in sincerity in all of our dealings. So even going back to what I said earlier about like, you know, it's it's great to hear that somebody who can say with confidence that they're like living with, with holiness and sincerity and that they're still going through a hard time because it's mm -hmm. a reminder of the fact that <laughs> we don't have this prosperity gospel of if I do really well, then bad things won't happen. You know, it's like, well, even Paul's going through, you know, yeah. a hard season has to suffer in these moments. Right. Um, in all of our dealings, we have depended on God's grace, not our own human wisdom. That is how we have conducted ourselves before the world, especially toward you. Our letters have been straightforward, and there's nothing written between the lines and nothing you can't understand. Um, I hope someday you will fully understand us, even if you don't understand us now. Then on the day uh, when the Lord Jesus returns, um, you would be proud of us in the same way that we are proud of you. So I think that that's even such a kind note from Paul, of just mm -hmm. like, yeah. I understand that some of the stuff I'm saying you guys aren't going to get. Paul, Paul also had urgency. Paul was really convinced in his lifetime Jesus would return. So yeah. He's communicating with urgency, and you can even pick that up in, in a lot mm -hmm. of his writings. But he's saying, like, you might not get this now, but I hope one day you do and, like, remember us well for it in the same way that I'm, like, even that generosity is like, I'm proud of you for applying it in the best way that you can with your limited understanding that you have in this moment. Yeah. And since I was so sure of your understanding and trust, I wanted to give you a double blessing by visiting you twice, um, which is, like, I don't, I've never had the confidence in my life to tell someone, like, I'm going to bless, give you a blessing by coming to your house tonight. Double like, blessing. That's how I'm going to start, like, planning social events. Like, guys, I'm going to give you a blessing tonight. I'm going to show up and eat your food. Um, first on my way to Macedonia, and then again when I return from Macedonia, and then you can send me on my way to uh, 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 Judea. You may be asking why I changed my plan. Do you think I make my plans carelessly? Do you think that I'm like people of the world who say yes when they really mean no? And um, then he kind of goes on this little mini rant, which I think is so great. Um, <laughs> as surely as God is faithful, our word to you does not waver between yes and no. For Jesus Christ, the Son of God, does not waver between yes and no. He is the one um, whom Silas, Timothy, and I preach to you. And uh, as God's ultimate yes, he always does uh, what he says. For all the, of God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ with a resounding yes, and through Christ our amen, which means yes, or I agree in you know, some translations, ascends to God for his glory. So he really transitions into like, hey, um, you know, I, I, I've given you guys this wisdom. You don't fully understand it for right now. I hope one day you do when Jesus comes back, and I hope you remember us well for it. I was going to come stop by again. You might be wondering why and almost like he's he's like explaining to, almost like justifying himself mm -hmm. he's like like this is not i'm everything that i do is intentional in the same way that god is consistent by saying yes his yes means yes he's always right. faithful if i'm going to say yes i'm going to do it i mean it um but that being said even in this little mini rant of justification i think it's like such a powerful truth um uh i remember when i was a kid growing up we had we weren't allowed to say i swear so if yeah. you had to like if you were promising something you'd be like oh i swear you know yeah, yeah. I, I swear i mean it my parents always like, nope, um, they picked up something from their, my parents met in their youth group. They picked up a turn of phrase to say, yay, yay. Like that was the version of, I swear. Like, huh. let your yeah, it's the King James version of let your yes be yes. Huh. So to this day, when I'm with my family or my sisters, if, like rather than like, you know, I promise or I swear, it's like, yay, yay. I mean, like you can't, like that's basically <laughs> saying I swear on somebody's life. Yay, yay is very sacred in our house, right? Uh. But, uh, but that's what Paul's saying. He's just like, we serve a God whose yes means yes, mm -hmm. you know, it means yes, let it be done. Like, yes, God mm -hmm. has fulfilled every promise, so I want the same, my words to carry the same weight. As a Christian, I mean, you could talk about it as a church leader too, but just as a Christian, as a person, why does it matter for your yes to be yes and your no to be no? Man, where do we go? Um, <laughs> I think there's so many who look to you when you profess Hey, I'm a Christian. Hey, mm. this is what I believe. This is the example that I'm leading in following Christ. There's an immediate lens on you to, to be a person who reflects that and everything that you do, you know? And I think that's the, the staggering thought and yet also the blessing of it is that you are that example for Christ in the way that you display yourself. And so, yeah, so if you are a person who is untrustworthy by your words, by your actions and deeds, and I think that immediately can you know, hinder your ability to, to truly be a person who reflects that, you know, Christ to others and those types of things. And that can be even in your own relationships, you know, you become an untrustworthy person, mm -hmm. you know, you say one thing, do another or vice versa, you know, and it's so 
I think there's always a challenge that comes with always developing level of trust with people and maintaining that. And mm-hmm. that is simply by saying and, and doing what you, you said you're going to do. Yeah. yeah I, I even love the way you said that. Like it's a staggering thought, but also a blessing. And that's so true. It is humbling. It is staggering. It is almost intimidating. Mm-hmm. Of like, I have to be an ambassador and a representative for Christ right. in my church, in my family. And all of a sudden it's like, Whoa. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. like that's really heavy where I want to say truthful things, mm-hmm. but it's also a blessing. Like when you can live your life with that consistency, when you say yes, it means yes. Mm-hmm. Um, that is that is a blessing to your character. It it creates when you speak, people will believe you because you have consistency behind it, yeah. um, and it and it also keeps your character aligned with what God would have for you. Right, you know? right, yeah. That's what I was gonna say. Is that it? Just it makes you that much more like Christ. You know, that was the way Christ was. That's the way God is, yeah. and we're supposed to be imitators of, of Christ. But like to me, I also look at it as like it's a character quality and it's integrity. You know, like those those are things that God calls us to as yeah. well, and so. Um, when I say yes, if I tell somebody yes, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it, you know, and if I say no, which is a harder one for me to say sometimes, <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> then I mean no. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, I just think it, it just, it's such a great reflection of Christ. But I think, just like you were saying, it makes you a trustworthy person as well because people yeah. know they can take you at your word. Yeah, and if you remember back in First Corinthians, Paul had to already do this with them in his first letter. He yeah. was mm-hmm. like, Hey, remember, this is what we believed in. Yeah. yeah. We're talking specifically about the resurrection, but this is what we believed in. I would not be doing these things. I would not be behaving this way or behaving this way. I would not 100%. be doing all these things that he's mentioning in the first chapter if I did not believe in the truth of what yeah. I'm telling right. you right, na- right here and yeah. now. So why would I do all that? Why would I even come to you and share this message with you if I didn't really yeah, so believe good. in it yeah. or have a moment with Christ yeah. in it? Yeah, and because he does, he's like, for that reason, when I say yes, it means yes. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Because I'm an image bearer of God because I do believe that Jesus is the resurrected, you know, living God himself. Like Mm -hmm. I am going to be as consistent in my character. And if I say something, it's because I believe it. I remember my dad told me when I was a kid, I remember him always saying like, all you have is your word. And I thought that was so silly. I'm Mm. like, that's (laughs) not true. Yeah. You have tons of stuff like that, that are outside of what, but I get that the the older I, the older I get in the sense of you can try to earn much and do much, but if people don't trust that you, when you talk, you might as well not talk. Mm -hmm. It's like, that's yeah. the only thing at the end of the day that can truly add weight to what you say is can you trust what they're saying? Mm-hmm. The moment that there's that like, oh, they might not be honest or they always, or you know, they're like, like flaky people where they're just like, they always say they're going to show up and they don't. Um, it, then, then all of a sudden the things that you say just mean less. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like everything you say is weighted less than. It's like if you say you're going to do something, that's something that I've had to like really struggle. I'm like a classic millennial where it's another thing my dad told me. He, he led a young adult class when I was a kid in our, in our church. I remember him always complaining about young adults are so non-committal because they'll just like leave, they don't want to say a hard yes to anything because they want to leave the door open in case something better comes along. I've had a battle that in my life a ton of times where it's like I want to do something and then something will pop up. I'm like, oh, that's way better. But I already said yes to this thing. <laughs> and through discipline and age, I've had to say like it doesn't matter even if I don't want to do this. I said yeah. I would do it, so I'm going to do it mm-hmm. because at the end of the day, you know, you don't want to be counted as somebody who's unreliable because right. then when you actually say something that matters, you want the weight to be there and mm-hmm. the consistency of your character to be able to back it up. Yeah. It's tough, but yeah, it's yeah. important. Um, this is verse 21. It's God who enables us along with you to stand firm for Christ. Uh, he has commissioned us. He has identified us um, as his own by placing the Holy Spirit in our hearts as the first installment that guarantees everything he has promised us. That first part really jumps out to me. It is mm-hmm. God who enables us. That yeah. simple sentence, I think, is like one of the most liberating things that I can apply to my life. Mm-hmm. It's not myself who enables us. It's not my own strength. It's not my own wisdom. I even talked about the importance of your your yes being yes. It's not even your own character in that sense that really enables us. It is God who enables us. How has that thought, has it brought you any peace in your life to know that like you don't have to rely on your own strength? Yeah. I. I like to have control (laughs) and I, I like, I mean, I, I'm not going to lie. I do depend on myself for a lot of things, but I feel like this is a a constant thing God and I have, have wrestled with. And I've really been working on, um, because I mean, just like I kind of referenced earlier, the things that God has been calling me to this year are things way out of my comfort zone, even way out of like my capabilities. Mm -hmm. And so it has brought me peace in knowing like, this isn't dependent on me. It's dependent on God. And I, I can have peace in knowing like that's a good thing because I probably will fail if I just depend on myself. Right. But if I depend yeah. on God, I know I'm going to succeed. I'm going to be able to do these things because he is going to give me, he's going to equip me. He's going to enable me. He's going to give me the things that I need. And I think it's so important. And it's been, it's been a really great journey, honestly, learning that because it really has 
put the perspective right back where it needs to be, where it's like, this is not about me. It's humbling, yeah, but well it's said. reminding myself, like, I have peace because God's got me. He's He's got it under control. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I've operated, I would say, 90% of my life in the false reality that I am in control, mm-hmm. or that I am worthy or that I'm strong enough or that I'm capable enough. And here just recently, I'm just learning over and over again the grace of God and how important it is in our lives and and how it literally shapes and molds everything that we do. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like I always for some reason fall into this weird sense of like that I can somehow reach or arrive at a place where I'm just going to one day not be able to rely on the grace of God. And I just don't Mm. think that's true or Mm -hmm. I believe that that's not true at all. And I believe Christ tells us that and Paul tells us that. And so for me, I'm in a season right now where, as even Stacy was speaking to, that like everything feels outside of my control. Mm -hmm. Before I would say I would just, oh, I'm just going to put systems in place and fix it and everything's going to be better. I'm in a place now where literally everything is outside of my control Mm -hmm. and my work and my home responsibilities, all of those things. And I recognize that. And so for me, it's like driving me deeper in my understanding of that I need God, that I need him exactly. to enable and empower me yeah. to be able to do and accomplish the things that he wants me to in mm-hmm. my life. Well, the reality is it's going to do one of two things. It's either going to drive you deeper in your relationship sure. with God and trust, or it'll drive you crazy. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh-huh. You know, like, yeah. It, oh, yeah. like it, it really goes one way or the other. If I, if I let those things that make me feel all of a sudden out of control, it's like, man, that is a recipe for me to have a meltdown. Uh-huh. For me to like just yep. lose it and to feel like God, like, now I'm angry and I'm frustrated and I feel like I can't, you know, I'm a type eight in the Enneagram and the biggest thing with that is everyone has like a driving thing. A lot of times mm-hmm. if you really, I'm not a huge Enneagram person, but I like, I know about it enough that it's all about like what your motivating factor is. And this is like gross to say it, but eight, your motivating thing is power. Mm-hmm. And it's not from a place of like feeling like you need to control other people. It makes you feel safe. Mm-hmm. Like I feel like if I have um, control over a situation, if I have control over the outcomes of a situation, I feel peaceful and I feel yeah. like that, you know, nothing can hurt me. I feel like, okay, we're all this buttoned up to live a life where you're so patently out of control. Like it's just not in your control right. all the time. Yeah. And that's not even just, that's not my job uniquely. That's humanity. Like uh-huh. right. nobody can like steal someone's autonomy and just make everyone be exactly what they want in any mm-hmm. given moment. You know, even having kids has been like such a humbling, <laughs> anything amount of times I look at my kids, I'm like, could you just do what I say? Uh-huh. <laughs> like, <Gosh. Yep. laughs> what is your problem? You know? And it's just a reminder of the fact that I am very much not in control, but it's that piece of it is God who enables us. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I think about that in ministry a lot. I feel like sometimes people, not all the time, but some people can glorify the office of ministry and think it's really cool and mm-hmm. special and like, yeah, this really unique calling on your life and how special that is. The reality is that like my experience getting into ministry was really, I never wanted to go into ministry. I never had this moment where mm-hmm. I had this calling of God's like, now you will go into ministry. Mm-hmm. It was God opening up doors that I walked through and was obedient. And that was it. That's how yeah. I got to the place I'm now just walking through open doors that I believe that the Holy spirit opened up. Um, but with that comes this reality that when things are not working out, mm-hmm. when I feel like I'm failing at my job, when I feel like I'm failing in my ministry, when I feel like things are awful and, and overwhelming and intense, I have to go back to that thought of it is God who brought me oh, here. Exactly. It is God who opened yeah, those doors. And so I must good. have that honest conversation of like, this was your dumb idea, God. Like, <laughs> I, didn't ask to, I didn't ask to do this. Yeah. Like, you, you're you the one who brought me to this place. I was obedient in it, sure. Right. So I'll take credit for that part. Right. But like, I didn't, want, I didn't ask for this stuff. Yeah. And that is, and it's that power of realizing like, okay, if God brought me here, if he enabled me to walk through those doors to get here in the first place, it's going to be him who enables me to find peace in it and to find success in it. It's not my responsibility. Mm -hmm. It's my responsibility to steward over it well, you know, but that's, that's where, that's where it ends though. You know, um, this is verse 23. It says, now I call upon God as my witness that I'm telling the truth. The reason I didn't return to Corinth (laughs) was to spare you from a (laughs) severe rebuke. Um, but that does not mean uh, we want to dominate you by telling you how to put your faith into practice. We want to work together with you so you'll be full of joy, for it is by your own faith that you stand firm. Um, so Paul's clearly saying that he delayed his visit so he wouldn't absolutely dunk on the church in Corinth. <laughs> it's like, it's like, I like the way you phrase that. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's literally how I wrote it there, yeah. Um, so he goes off of like saying, hey, I have a yes, is which is my yes. Like if I, I'm like God in that sense, which is very bold of Paul, but also a good lesson of like, if I'm going to say yes, it's because I say yes. And it's because God is consistent with all of his promises. He's like, so just so you know the context, the reason why I didn't is because I would severely, I wanted to spare you from a severe rebuke. And again, he says, that doesn't mean I want to dominate you. I'm not trying to embarrass you. I'm, I want you to be full of joy. And, and you know, that's his heart. But he's like, but that just so we're all clear, that's the reason why I'm not showing up in person right now. Um, just as like a practical note, what do you, do you think there's value at all in taking time before you confront someone? So Paul's like, maybe I'll wait on, on to show up in person for that reason. 
Um, have you guys found value in that in your own life? 100%. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> well, I don't like confrontation anyway, so it takes me some time before I confront people. Sure. Anyway. But I, I do think there's value in it um, just because I think it gives you a moment to clear your thoughts, to not do it out of emotions, but to really pray, Dude, press into one. God, yeah. and to allow him to direct the conversation. Because if I, like I know, like I could just use my daughter, for example, when she drives me bonkers and I am like at my wits end and I yell at her, I'm like, this wasn't the best way to handle this. Right. Like we know that, but I allowed my emotions to get the best of me. Whereas when I instead am like, take a deep breath, take a pause. Yeah. Let's talk about this. You know, it, it goes better. It really, it's better sure. for both of us. She yeah. feels more loved. She feels like she's heard. And so I think it just really helps you to really do it in a more loving, godly way. Oh, I think. So good. Absolutely. With your brand. Yeah. I feel like Paul is just really stepping into that pastoral ministry world in the beginning of this letter. It feels like he's just like all over the place, you know, mm -hmm. in terms of emotionally and how he's trying yeah. to comfort the church. I mean, he starts off by saying, God is all this comfort to us. And then he's right. like, well, I'm going to blast you. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> God is all this comfort. I got to tell you about my trip in Asia. Yeah, <laughs> it was exactly. awful. And now I'm, now you're in trouble. So yeah, I'm going to exactly. give, I'm gonna give it a Which is exactly what ministry feels like. <laughs> uh, 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 <laughs> A hundred percent. Yeah. <laughs> I think theologians believe that there is a letter in between this where yes. Paul is blasting them. And so he references mm. that in the beginning right. of, yeah. of chapter two. But so Paul has been there, done that. And he said, we were talking about that yesterday. Like, boy, would I be curious to read that letter. He's like, I can't do it anymore. I know this is not bringing you joy by me yeah. being hyper aggressive. So I need to push pause. <laughs> I need to reflect on like that. My emotions are driving this. And the last mm -hmm. thing that I want to do is drive you from experiencing the joy of your faith and of exactly. your ministry. And so there is pause and like, I'm going to wait. And so for me, I'm the same way, like emotions run high in my blood, man. Mm -hmm. I'm just like, everything yeah. is so amped up in so many ways. And so if I were to respond immediately and I often do, but yeah. if I respond immediately in that emotional state, it just destroys You know, everything. it's not your best it's, chance. It, at, it's yeah. not right. great, you right. know, at producing any good. Yeah. yeah. I'm almost the opposite of you, Stacey, where you mentioned that you like, like naturally, you know, it takes you a second to like get to the point where you want to confront somebody. Mm -hmm. I want to confront someone that second, <laughs> like in the moment, you know, to, to a fault yeah. where I'm, I'm such a, I'm an external processor. Mm -hmm. So I figure things out. If I feel like I have to figure it out in my own brain, I'll go crazy. Mm -hmm. I need to talk to somebody. I need to, yeah. you know, have a conversation. So especially if I'm frustrated, I literally in the moment want to say, you're frustrating me. Here are the five reasons why. And like, and just like <laughs> absolutely do it in that moment. Because the longer I sit with it, I feel anxious and I feel uncomfortable mm -hmm. and I get like, and I just can't have peace in my mind. And I just want to get it over with, mm -hmm. you know, I'd rather have a yelling match than sit on it, you know, <laughs> which is not wise. I wouldn't recommend that. Um, but that's, the, but that's my reality. So it, it has taken, uh, my sister Mary taught me this even when we were teenagers where she, she would just be like, we can talk about this later. And she'd walk out of the room and I'd be like, we certainly will not. And I'm like, I'll follow, follow, you out of this. I'll follow you right in your bedroom. I'm like, you will not, you know, we're going to figure it out right now. And she's, she just taught me, you know, with age and time, even as adults, she has to remind me, she's like, just give me a minute, dude. Yeah. Like, let me right. have a second to like, think about what you're saying and like process it. And that's so hard because I am an, an external processor. I want to have it out right there and I don't like sitting on it. Mm -hmm. But I've also realized that is so rarely one, even for someone else's sake, if that's not how they process, you're not giving them an opportunity yeah. to bring their best uh, to the table. Mm -hmm. Right. But even for myself, it's impossible to avoid emotions when you're still in the moment. So yeah. just to have the wisdom, it's not right. easy. It's I'd hate it, but it's like right. super important just to take a beat, allow yourself to, to feel peace, allow yourself to think about it well before you go approach a situation. I think there's a lot of wisdom in that. And God, like, and God, oh, sorry. No, no, no. And good. God can often change your perspective in that too. Oh, you know, amazing. where it's like, All the time, maybe yeah. I took it that way. Um, or even when you take that moment to wait and you confront them, sometimes they don't even realize it. You know, yeah. like sometimes they're like, I didn't realize that that was how that came across in that mm -hmm. moment or that right. was how, you know, I mean, it's not always that way, but I think yeah. when Definitely. you allow it, to have a little bit of time where it's like, okay, I'm at peace about this. I've prayed about this. God has maybe even given me a different perspective and helped me to see that person through his lens instead yeah. of through my emotions. I think it helps that situation too. Man, yeah. it's, it's super good. You even see Paul, what is he doing? He's writing a letter. He's like, imagine if this was in person, there's, <laughs> there's a chance that he would not have talked about, I want you to be so full of yeah, joy yeah. Right. that he just would have been like, what is wrong with you? Exactly. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Exactly. And I think that's like yeah. having the patience to like, it's the old trick of like write an email and don't send it. Like mm -hmm. wait till the next day. Mm -hmm. Like there's wisdom in that. Just yeah. write something down, process it, think about it. Yeah. You right. know? And oftentimes for me, it's the conviction of a heart change in that process. Yeah. Like that mm -hmm. I'm coming at this too hot. I'm mm -hmm. judgmental oh, or sure. I am in this state. I'm nearsighted. Like, I'm righteous. Whatever I yeah. am in right. right now. So God will often speak to that and I'll be like, okay, mm -hmm. now I understand. Now I can love and, and see a different That's perspective. So yeah.
Um, all right, so this is jumping into, into chapter two, verse two now. Um, so, uh, uh, yep, so I decided that I would not bring you grief with another painful visit. <laughs> For if I cause you grief, who will make you glad? Certainly not someone who I have grieved. Um, this is why I write to you as I did, so that when I do come, I won't be grieved by the very ones who ought to give me the greatest joy. <clears throat> Man, that is a minister's heart right mm -hmm. there. Um, yeah. Surely you all know that my joy comes from you being joyful. And I think he really means that. I think he means that he's frustrated. I yeah. think he understands. Mm -hmm. But I, I sure. really do think that's an honest take. It like, I want you to be joyful. Right. I wrote that letter in great anguish is the letter that Brandon was alluding to um, where they think there's a, there's a letter that we don't have access to or haven't, you know, found with a troubled heart and many tears. Um, I don't want to grieve you, but I want to let you know how much mm -hmm. love I have for you. This is mm -hmm. like, this is something that would have been hard for me to, hard for me to understand before I had kids, mm -hmm. you know, of yeah. mm -hmm. this idea of like, you're punishing your kids, you're lecturing your kids, you're upset with your kids, not because you hate them, not because you don't want them to have joy, not mm -hmm. because you don't love them. In mm -hmm. fact, it is the opposite. It's like, I want you to have joy. I want you to be loved. Yeah. I do love you. I care about you. Um, you know, he says, he literally says his joy comes from them being joyful. Mm -hmm. So here's like the question, how can correcting someone or even being corrected, think about yourself from the perspective of the Corinthians, how can yeah. that bring you joy? How can that possibly happen? What do you guys think? Only through God. No, <laughs> 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 no I, you know, in the moment, it's hard when somebody calls you out on something. Like I think, probably the biggest one for us would be like with our spouses, you know, where it's like when Ben calls me out on something, I'm like, that's the worst. You're, I don't believe you. But then it's like <laughs> yeah. when you take a moment and it's like, yeah, you're right. But I think there's joy in when you realize like, first of all, that person loves you enough that mm -hmm. they want to so help good. you become more like Christ. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so I think that that is where you can find joy. But I think also when you do listen to their words of wisdom and you apply that, just becoming more like Christ, I think you find joy in that too. Super good. What do you yeah. think, Brandon? Oh man, I'm a work in progress in this area, <laughs> uh, finding joy in those types of things. And I think the biggest thing, even as Stacy spoke to, is that you're trusting that other person to to see something in you that you don't see. And mm -hmm. so the end result, the fruit of it in the long run will be in that correction that will be a more peaceful life, a more joyful life, a right. more fulfilling life. And so as much as you don't love it in that moment, the long run is I'm so thankful that a person would be willing to speak to me mm -hmm. in that way so that I can experience the full life that Christ offers me. And uh, one of the triggers for me is repeat offenders, you know, mm -hmm. like people who just come Oof. back over yeah. and over and over again and the same thing. And I'm, tr I'm trying to tell them from a loving perspective, like if you would right. change this thing, this would dramatically I promise make your life better. improve yeah. your life to the max, you know. Right. Um, but when they finally do that, and they experience that there is a joy, like a, a praise, a worship moment of like, yeah. oh, now I get it. This is so great. You right. Know? Yeah. For me, I think a big part of it is becoming, um, I view it almost like working out where it's like, if you can fall in love with the results, mm -hmm. you don't have to really love the process. That's good. Yeah. So like, <laughs> yeah. I, like, like I, I run enough, like I run, you know, enough for me, like I run a few times a week and I have still never loved it. You know, like I've never really... <laughs> You hear things about like, oh, if you run far and long enough, you get a runner's high. Like I told you that one time where I got, I was really sick. And it was like my third day of being sick. I just ran. I ran for eight miles. I'm like, I'm gonna run until I don't feel sick anymore. So I'm so, so Such tired a of dumb it. Philosophy. I know. Which it would, I, yeah, well, I, it worked. I, all right. I worked. I came back. I literally ran until my fever broke. I'm not saying this is good, this is a good idea, but um, but it worked, right? And so I came home, but I didn't like. I I, I, hate, I hated the process of it. I hate mm -hmm. when I run, but I like the feeling afterward. I think receiving correction has never been joyful for to me. It, it, joyful yeah. to me. I think I've lied in the past. I, I didn't know I was lying, but I've said like, I've said this before. Oh, I think I'm. Gonna, I love being corrected now because it just means I get to be better. I'm like, I still don't love being corrected. <laughs> like, I think that sounds cool, but what what is genuine about it is I love the result of being corrected. Yeah. I love the I love the joy that it brings me by being better and mm -hmm. acting different and finding more healing and wholeness and a better way to live. That part is so satisfying to me. Right. Um, but yeah, the process in itself isn't good. So it's not so much that like being corrected in the process. Maybe there are some people who have truly fallen in love with like even the process of being corrected. I like <laughs> now that's just not, that's just not where, that's just not where I'm at right now. Right. Um, but you know, but I do, but becoming addicted to the result and becoming a, you know, no, I want the result of being better. I want yeah. the result, whether it be working out or being corrected. Right. I want that joy of when I live my life in a better way, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So here's another question. What's the difference between loving correction and non-loving correction? So Paul says at the very end, but I want to let you know how much love I have for you. I don't want to grieve you. Mm -hmm. that, you know, um, he's like, I, I wrote this letter in ang anguish. I had a troubled heart with many tears. But the reality is like, I love you. I'm not writing it because I'm angry at you. I'm not writing it because right. I hate you, but because I despise you. It's because I love you. 
what is what what are some hallmarks of that difference that you can say I am correcting somebody because I am angry because I'm resentful versus I love this person so much how, how can you tell the difference between those two things yeah this is where that pause comes into effect mm -hmm. I feel the yeah, most yeah. in the sense of like questioning your heart and where you're at and what your motives are and wanting to see that change in that person and I think just a weird like simplistic i don't know if it's weird but simplistic kind of model that i use is if i'm not in pursuit of their betterment mm -hmm. if it's not self-serving if it's not like something that i want to change because it helps me in some way shape or form but if it's truly for their benefit yeah. that's when i know that my heart is in the right and mm -hmm. that i have the position to correct them i mean some of it is authority some of it is my position like i can correct mm -hmm. people but the heart is still like man do i want you to live a better life do i want your marriage to be better do i want your finances to be better do i want your relationship with christ to be better and if that is my motive and my drive then i think that kind of is where i kind of check myself and make sure that that's where i'm operating from mm -hmm. at all times yeah, yeah super good yeah i would agree with that i think it is that not doing it right there in the moment. And I think I think you can tell the difference too is that it is the asking that question like, is this for my selfish gain or is this for the betterment of them and for the betterment of the body? Yeah, because I think we have to acknowledge it does feel good to dunk on somebody at times yeah. and to be I'm, like, yeah. well, you're dumb I'm and here's right. five reasons why. <laughs> exactly, that, that feel, that's why people do it. It right. feels good to put someone in their place, especially when they've wronged you. 100%. Exactly, yeah. or because like Brandon said, because we are in authority, we do have that, but it's not yeah. lording our authority over them. It's, it's, it's well literally said. looking yeah. at that person and saying like, I care so much about you that I can't allow you to keep doing this. Yeah, so and I think that that's the difference. I think it's all about how we, the perspective we go in with it, the attitude we go in with it. And even if we're the person being corrected, you know, I can tell you a difference between somebody who's correcting me just to correct me or somebody who's like, I'm correcting you because I love you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think how they approach it, how they respond to you, the, how the conversation goes, I think that that determines if you can tell which type of correction it is. Yeah, super good. I think, you know, I think for me, it might be overly simplistic, but like I do, at least to keep my own heart in check, I do a check down of how do I feel? Mm -hmm. Like if I'm going to confront someone, am I angry? If I'm angry, I'm probably going to try to put them in their place because it feels right. good. Mm -hmm. it, it like satiates that anger of like, yeah, that makes me feel better. Right. You know? um, or, or do I feel love towards them and care? It's mm -hmm. like, man, I, I really wish you didn't do that because I think it'd be better for you. I think it'd be better for me. I think it'd be better for our relationship, our friendship. Right. Just by doing a quick gauge of how do I feel? It's like, I'm, I do it with my kids all the time. It's like, I'm gonna wait to go talk to that kid in timeout. I'm gonna wait to go talk to her until I feel not angry. Mm -hmm. And the moment that I feel like, okay, like I need to talk to her about this because it's good for her, not because I'm like frustrated and wanna give her the business, that's when it feels safe to me to be like, okay, I go. Yeah. Where it gets tricky is all of a sudden somebody gets you all riled up again and you know, they might argue back and they might like give you a bunch of pushback and then you can get frustrated again. And that's yeah. where you have to really try to master your emotions in the moment, which is a complicated process. Mm -hmm. But right. at least going into it with that heart of like, I am only talking to you right now because of how much I love you, not yeah. because of how angry I am. Mm -hmm. right. I think there's some wisdom in that, just gauging your own heart and your own emotions off of it. For right. Sure, yeah. right. And I think, you know, like we have that podcast, like I could be wrong. Mm -hmm. I think it's going in with that type of attitude too, you know, like whereas oh, yeah. like we have a limited perspective. And so I need to be willing to listen as much as I, or maybe even, you know, talk less and listen more so yeah. that that might even help that process a little bit better. That's such a weird thing about reading Paul's works is like, this is the inspired authoritative word of God. When we speak, that's not the case. Like mm. it's largely our opinion about stuff. Right. So even when you feel like you're hundred percent sure, go into it with a humble posture mm -hmm. of it. Even if you're like, no, no, you wronged me, still <laughs> keep it an open hand because you could be missing something, you could be missing right. context, mm -hmm. you could be wrong in that sense. And right. I think that's also helpful. And that's the way we were talking about kids, you know, that's such an easy example. That's also deeply embarrassing. You mm -hmm. know, we're like, I, I had, like, the, the, I hate nothing less than apologizing to my kids. It's the most embarrassing thing ever. Like, I hate having to say I'm sorry to them. But I think with Darby recently where she told me, it's like, well, mom told me I could do this. Mm -hmm. I was like, your mom did not tell you could do that. Go to your room. <laughs> like, no, no way. She started crying, and I'm like, oh, man, geez, that's frustrating. I'm like, now I got to go, you know, you know, talk her through it and explain why she's not allowed to lie and this whole thing. And, and which is, a, you know, I'm not like dreading that, but it's like, okay, this is the next step. And I went and talked to Gina, and she's like, I did tell her to do that. I'm like, oh, <laughs> man. And the last thing I want to do is like gaslight my kids. I don't want to go in and be like, well, I only thought that because you lie all the time. <laughs> yeah. right. Like the right move is to teach them early on that like it's okay to say sorry. So when I'm like, I'm yeah. so sorry. Like I was wrong. Yeah. I shouldn't have assumed that. I, I talked to your mom. Like, will, will you forgive me? That's the word. They tell, ask a four-year-old mm. to forgive you is yep. like, oh, little jerk. <laughs> 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 but there's so much power. That's the reality of where we are a little bit different than Paul writing to the Corinthians. It's like, it, you know, that is also part of having that loving posture. It's yeah. holding it with open hand, knowing that you could be wrong about it. Right. 
Yeah, and he gives him space to be able to process the stuff that he shared with him. And I think that's why even like the letter yeah, well mentality is so mm -hmm. good because he was like, I'm going to give you space to be able to sit on what I'm telling you, live out your faith. I don't want to like create insecurity or somehow hinder your ability to be able to pursue Christ in this. Right. Like he's like, I want to give you well space. Said. And Absolutely. so I think like even as we speak into people, we have to give them space to receive that correction. And sometimes mm -hmm. people respond in like both of my kids respond in different ways. Like one shuts down completely yeah. and then I'll hear mm -hmm. about more of it like three days later. And I'm like, oh, you were processing oh, wow. this. Mm -hmm. yeah. Whereas one just wants to like bicker and argue back. You know, yeah. you guys can decide who, which, you know, kids <laughs> which. <laughs> I think, I think <laughs> yeah. You know, so they each respond differently. So I have to almost be prepared in my mm -hmm. correction to make sure that I'm prepared for that as well and to right. give them space yeah. to do that. Yeah, I think that's just as loving as, as all the other things we talked about is I got have like my relationship with Kenny is like that where mm. it's like my best bud um, he's a, a tech director here at the church in my like I said my preference is the external process I want to talk mm. about it I want to like flesh it out I want to arm wrestle about it I want to figure out the the truth of the situation he's not like that mm -hmm. it, it takes him a second to process <laughs> yeah. where if I go try to argue with him or tell him something he'll just look at me and he's like okay in his mind he's going to go take time to chew on it and get back to me right. so I learned uh, you know um, a habit uh, where I'll just send him a text of like here's here's what I'm dealing with let's talk about it on your time and then we'll mm -hmm. follow it up with an in-person conversation right. right but to love someone in that way of like mm -hmm. you know or even like hey I'm, I'm worried about this thing take some time to think about it then let's meet I, but I did that literally this week with you because I know you're more of an internal processor I'm right. like well you're like let's have a conversation about this I'm like all right going into it here are my thoughts <laughs> on your time let's meet about it because that's a way to love people where they're at and say no I don't need you to submit to the way that I want to communicate yeah. right now I love I'm not just doing this for my ego or to feel better I love you we love right. each other let's edify each other in that mm -hmm. yeah so even knowing people and Mm -hmm. making it a part of the way you love them to learn their communication preference. Yeah. You can go into the, the thick of it and be like, well, they, they, I don't have to do it the way that they right. want it. They should do it the way that I want it. Sure. You can mm -hmm. say that, but like, what's the more loving posture is right. to die to yourself and exactly. to say, I love you enough to meet you where you are. Mm -hmm. So I want to do this on your terms in a way that you feel like you're going to be able to successfully communicate how you feel in a way that honors us both. Like right. that's, that's huge. Yeah. 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 Putting that other person, like putting your, it is putting yourself in the other person's <laughs> shoes, essentially. Yeah. Like you were saying that, I, I am a high emotion person and I take things personally, you know, mm -hmm. so if somebody's going to correct me or something, I'm going to, I'm going to cry. I'm going to be upset. I'm going <laughs> to, yeah. you yeah. know, I'm going to feel shame. I'm going to beat myself up. Yeah. And so like having people that know that about me, like I know many times people will, they'll give me an encouraging word and they'll be like, Hey, have you ever thought sandwich. about, yeah. because they know me well enough, but I yeah. appreciate that. They know me. They're loving me in that moment. Well, I remember one of the first work conversations that you and I had. So, so when you when you joined our team, is I, is the first thing I told you is like, hey, I'm going to tell you a lot of stuff. Don't put a false sense of urgency on it. Like, yeah. I'm not feeling urgent about this. <laughs> right. And I just remember seeing your face. You're like, okay, I could do that. I'm just like knowing that your natural bent is like, that's a huge list. It might feel like a lot. It might mm -hmm. feel like I can't do all that this week, so I don't want to fail. Is just making sure you love someone enough to say like. I'm going to clearly communicate the expectation. Right. I'm not putting that on you. Exactly. Don't put it on yourself. Right. It's all about that. Meet someone exactly where they are in the moment and to exactly. be able to love them well. Yeah. yeah. Super good. <laughs> good stuff. Cool. You guys have any closing thoughts? I do not. Nope. I think that's it. I think that's all we got. Well, hey guys, thank you so much for joining us on this uh, for this podcast for this Bible study podcast. I hope it, I hope it edified you. I mm -hmm. hope that you know. Uh, I said this last time I hosted. One of the best ways that I learn is are hearing people talk about mm -hmm. really anything, whether it be a topic, an issue, or specifically the Word of God. So I hope you pulled things from it. I hope it blessed your life, um, and we certainly hope that you join us next time. Thank you.